everyone. I'm Prakul Agarwal. I'm the product manager for machine learning at MongoDB. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about accelerating path to production for AI apps. So with that, there is a lot of excitement in this new era where we are democratizing AI. So I did want to start off with taking a step back and looking at how things have been evolving, how we got here. So the evolution of intelligence in applications. We started off with just analytics in the early days of computing, where we wanted to just make sense of data. This involved analyzing large data sets and extracting insights that would inform business decisions. As computing power increased, it became easier to analyze larger and larger data sets. Things moved on from there to this batch AI, where we train model on historical data and use them to make predictions about future events. This approach is still widely used, particularly in industries like finance, healthcare. Things moved on to real-time AI. This represented a significant step forward and involved training on live data and making predictions in real time. This is particularly useful for industries like e-commerce where decisions need to be made quickly based on changing circumstances, which has led us to the holy grail era, generative AI. This is the cutting edge, which involves training models to generate new content. We are beyond just making predictions from historical data to creating novel images, text, et cetera. However, it's important to understand we are very much in the infancy, and there are a lot of limitations. So as we continue moving forward with this, how do we take perspectives and lessons from the past on how exactly this journey can be accelerated? So I want to make a point on, invite you all to think about that the data, your private data especially, is what creates a differentiation with any kind of AI model. And this is especially true with large language models that we are seeing today. However, managing data introduces all kinds of challenges. And I want to talk about how to manage and think about those challenges. First of all, there you want to be thinking about batch versus streaming data. Right now, there's a lot of focus on the prompt engineering and just getting past the point, but as the ecosystem evolve, we will be seeing more and more kinds of data modalities, whether it is capturing on how your customers are interacting to IoT data, et cetera. Then you want to be thinking about generating embeddings, right? That's a major piece, a kind of annoying piece in the whole ecosystem of like, you know, wanting to do differentiated work and creating applications that solve a real problem than handling the DevOps problem. To thinking about the cost, how do you want to optimize the cost? How do you want to think about cold data versus hot data? And how do you think about like optimizing the cost of running those models? To thinking about enterprise readiness. Typically, you would have a moment where app which has been built out will require to scale, will require the necessary performance, and also for a lot of enterprise and a lot of like industries, the compliance, security are super essential components. With large language models, generative AI, there is a whole bunch of discussion about security and compliance on how and what kind of data is used for training to actually making use of the private data from the enterprise. And if you send it to OpenAI, will they be using it to train it, to having a whole open source movement. But these are the things that can be a clincher between being able to sell your application to a real customer from just having something that works and is a great demo. So with this, just thinking about the limitations of the LLMs, they are great on a lot of general purpose reasoning and task, but think about it. They are trained on the same corpus and given the same question, will be giving the similar answers. They don't have knowledge of your data. They don't have current up-to-date understanding. Try asking a question about like, you know, who's the prime minister of UK and good luck with getting that answer. Um, so with that, uh, I want to introduce MongoDB Atlas and how that provides a platform, a data platform specifically to bring your AI apps to production 
at scale securely while being enterprise ready. Now, for the piece of bringing an AI app, I want you all in, to invite on thinking of the different components that have been battle tested from the various generations. So from the very beginning, you want to have some traditional strengths like asset transactions, like secondary indexes, unions joins. And these are the things that MongoDB and other databases bring to the picture. But the real value of having a platform in your application development strategy from the very beginning comes from having these differentiated offerings where you want to be thinking of how will you be streaming your data into your ML models? How will you be doing the full text search to get the right kind of prompts that you want to engineer? To being able to thinking of using tiered data of being able to use object storage alongside having cache hot data and being able to like, you know, finding the right performance for the cost that you want to entail. To essentially being the enterprise readiness, the scalability, the compliance, being multi-cloud, and being able to have these capabilities for encryption, compliance, security. So one such example, like, you know, we want to think of being on multiple clouds, multiple public clouds. So for instance, you are on your self-hosted AWS is something that's offering you great models you want to move there. Having a MongoDB Atlas or a data platform can actually effortlessly get you on that particular cloud where you can cut down on the inference cost, where you can be compliant with your customer that you're trying to sell your application to. If you want to move to Google, use TPUs, go ahead, do that. Like, you know, just being able to effortlessly migrate your data to the public cloud of your choice without having a vendor lock-in becomes pretty critical. And all of these things, you want to think about how does this all integrate with the ML models and embedding services that you would want to be using to having a easy deployment management path, right? You want to start from your laptop, you want to get into your on-prem data source, like you know, being on any cloud provider of your choice. All of this while providing access to your data in a variety of languages and queries, which are native to the language of your choice. So one such integration that I want to talk about is with MindsDB, uh, who are thankfully the sponsors of this, and that's why we are here. So with MindsDB, MongoDB has native queries that let you bring in your any types of ML models right closer to your data where it lives. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how, in just a few steps, you can start using OpenAI models within your database. So really simple. So like start with building out the Mongo shell, get into MindsDB. You just initialize your OpenAI engine, which is as simple as creating a database query in MongoDB's native query language, which is MQL. With that, you just get down to creating a model that would be talking about like, you know, what's the engine in this case, OpenAI, and you want to be using it to predict a certain sentiment, and you want to be giving it a certain prompt that you want to be running on its own. So the benefit there is once it's stored as a query onto your database, you're not really worried about managing the prompt template as part of your application. This gives you the native ability to do version control, to being able to use various versions, experiment things out, etc. The fifth step is uh, just to be able to connect any data source that you want to run predictions on. This would be tables and collections and databases that are there. And voila, like you know, just run the prediction as a normal. You would run a normal query. Uh, with MongoDB, like you know, the expressiveness of the query is something of benefit. You can really cut down on your cost and uh, really bring in the best of the both worlds with MindsDB and MongoDB's native strengths. So moving on, um, I do want to talk about the challenges of data. And with this, I want to use a specific example of how do we build a chatbot securely over your 
private enterprise data. So I know this is something that has been uh, covered in detail already in some sense, and that's a hot of topic of the town. But I really want to dig in a little bit about how to do this as part of a secure, scalable setup. And with that, I want to talk about for building a private chat, chat GPT like bot, you first thing you want to be doing is starting from the very left, is integrating your various private knowledge sources. With this, you want to go through a sequence of steps on how do we chunk the data of each data, different data source, how do you want to store it, how do you want to generate embeddings, to being able to finally have it in a manner where you can query and run different kind of indexes. So this particular example I'm gonna be walking through is built with uh, Llama Index, which provides some native integrations into MongoDB as a native source. So I'm gonna walk you through an example on just in less than 20 lines of code, you can integrate all these different knowledge sources and be ready and have all the different kinds of scalability compliance out of the box. Yeah, I'm just trying to move uh, into here. Okay. I don't know. Uh, the large language model is the data sources. In this example, we want to get an answer to a question How much better is GPT 4 in reducing hallucinations over GPT 3.5? For a question like this, ChatGPT will just respond with that it's not something that it knows as the knowledge is restricted to September 2021 and prior. This piece of is the voice audible No. Okay, so I'm just going to do a voiceover. So the question I want to get answered here is about how much better is ChatGPT 4 in reducing hallucination over GPT 3.5 and using a out of the box language model will not be getting you that answer. There is a restriction of 721. So for this purpose, I want to be using a PDF source, which is the GPT 4 technical report. And this is a 100 page long PDF that I want to be integrating as a data source. This has all sorts of data, like, you know, this would have text, images, graphs, et cetera. But the first thing is we want to prepare it in a manner which can be consumed as part of a large language model. So to do this, uh, we are really going to first thing is just load this as part of a doc. This is where I downloaded the PDF. With this, uh, we want to move on to being able to Now we want to convert this into chunks, like you're, all of you are aware of that. To use large language model, you cannot use the entire 100 pages of data because there are context length limitations. So we do want to chunk this out into a format uh, which is accessible to these large language models. So with this, we are with Llama Index's node parser we are converting the 100 page document into these nodes, Slam index nodes. Uh, I don't want to highlight like, you know, at this point, it's been converted into these 107 nodes. And each node really represents a certain chunk of text, which is part of that PDF. And I want to show like how easy it is to get this from a working, like a notebook into a production grade environment. So the next step is we want to get these nodes persisted into MongoDB. MongoDB offers a pre-atlas cluster in public cloud of your choice. So initialize that, point this to the MongoDB instance. And from that, we can quickly move on to actually storing these nodes from an in-memory setup into something that is part of uh, managed storage. So to initialize that, uh, we want to 
make a call to a one interface line, which is MongoDB document store, point it to the URI and the database name, docstore.addDocuments, and voila, like this is something that is starting to get processed. And once we look, move on over to our doc store, uh, our 107 documents, those initial chunks that were created, are now basically getting processed and part of a database. So this is the structure that got created by Llama Index. And right now, it's in progress. So about 68 docs are there. Moving on, this all of those got persisted. So this is something part of a data feature engineering that you need to do just once. And you can move on and go ahead and use your query services. So the next storage abstraction that's basically shown is the flexibility that you would need uh, with this kind of a setup. So the context window length really varies from 2K to 100K for different kinds of models. And you want a data store which provides you that flexibility. Right? It's easy to experiment on your laptop. But once you want to be doing this at scale, you want an easy experimentation. So one of the core features that I want to highlight here is a document model, which is different from a traditional row-based SQL model that gives you the flexibility while giving you the speed uh, that you would not get from a file system. So I just want to talk about like these the role of data. So these are the three interfaces which are useful for a generative AI application. Starting from a document store, there is a second one is the index store, and third one is the vector store. So you can be doing this in memory, you can be doing this in MongoDB, and for the vector search, vector search, as you all know, is the long-term memory for large language models, helps a lot with embeddings and the search, and there are a bunch of options that you can use there. Moving on, this is super simple to store the created indexes. Um, as part of like, you initialize the storage context, you want to just give out what underlying store you want to use. And let's go ahead with an example of creating like vector indexes. So vector indexes in Llama index is something that would take each chunk of your data which is an unstructured text and convert it into an embedding. Embedding is really this like a array of floats which turns your unstructured data into structured and you can perform all kinds of computation. That's the super magic power of this generative application which lets you read the right chunk. So now once that is done, it takes a while Again, there is benefit to doing this in a persistent manner. This is something that gets persisted into MongoDB as well, or any other data store that you would choose with this. And we used up a bunch of embeddings. So important point is converting this PDF use a lot of these embedding tokens. And you don't want to be doing this repeatedly as you experiment. So the benefit here really is once you are considering data platform or data storage as part of your application from the very beginning, you can just do it once and really optimize on the cost as you change the direction, as you change the schema, as you change these things. So having it in a stored manner really makes a difference. I just want to show that we had those initial documents. Now you have your indexes generated in this case as well. So there are other kinds of indexes that you can go for list index, keyword index, to being able to, once that's done, ingestion is done. With these three lines of code, you once you want to do downstream query in your application, this is what you would be doing. And all of this feature engineering and data engineering process that we did, is something you can 
skip over and just start building our application on. So now let me get down to the query which we started off with, which is getting an answer to how much better is GPT-4 in reducing hallucinations over GPT-3.5. So the approach in this case is to actually go over all your chunks, all your, all your information. So as you can imagine, as the number of your data sources grow, this is something you don't want to be managing on your local system or on file system. So sorry for the small text, but this time we get the right answer from GPT. So it's giving us GPT-4 improves the latest, the GPT-3.5 model by 19 percentage points, which significant gains across all topics. So this is something that used two of these nodes, which were retrieved quickly from MongoDB. And this just goes on to show uh, how much value of the data that like, you, know, you have in creating like, differentiated application experiences. Cool. Um, just want to gloss over some of the things we played in this case, uh, having the flexibility because your model requirements and your feature sets will change. You want to, I want to touch upon an important point, which is how do you generate embeddings? So embedding generation typically is something that people do as part of their application workflow, but I want to introduce triggers and having a managed offering which can initially, essentially like, you know, put this in an autopilot mode. So this is an integrated offering which, where you can define server-side logic anytime your doc document or data is added, updated, or removed. So this is different from like an SQL data trigger which runs on the database server. Because it's running on a separate serverless computer instance, it can scale independently of your database server and not mess with the performance that you would be getting there. This trigger uh, basically lets you call Atlas functions and forward any events to external hand handlers through something like an AWS event bridge. What this really does is you can just set up a data pipeline where you are getting your data sources, chunking it, and putting it into a database, as I showed you, and each of those chunks can will be like calling a certain embedding model of your choice and getting the embedding generated. So this really becomes like a seamless experience instead of you having to manage this part of the whole process. I just wanna talk about like, you know, adding a trigger is super simple. It all works seamlessly where you would choose a database collection that I showed you in the previous slides on where your embedding, your chunks are being added. It will automatically monitor for changes or you can also schedule it to run out certain schedule. With this, you can activate triggers um, anytime an update or a change happens on your scheme. A little bit of a configuration, but works very much out of the box. Now, next step would be to define a function. Uh, so just showing a simple example of define a function and the process of data plumbing of the new chunk being ingested and run and embedding being generated and inserted into databases handled automatically without you having to worry about it. So in this case, we are just calling hugging faces, uh, some of the inference endpoints and making some changes on our database objects. So with this, just let, I wanna to touch a little bit about the need for compliance and auditing and thinking of that as part of a holistic strategy from the very beginning as you think of experimenting with the latest models. So these are really important stuff, but really very commoditized, so you don't want to be doing this yourself. Things like thinking of authentication, thinking of who in the organization with what roles gets access to what kind of data and what kind of applications, to thinking of like, you know, how would you provide the audit trail if the company needs that to thinking of encryption, to thinking of getting these different certifications. 
all a lot of things, but can be really handled in a very simple, seamless manner if you're using a, a scalable data platform from the very beginning. So with that, uh, yeah, like I think that was my talk, and thank you so much. Uh, any questions? I'm here. Hello. Uh, just a quick question. Is that notebook available somewhere? Uh, yeah, like so uh, we will be making that available after this event. Uh, I don't know what the process for that will be, but I'll talk to Eric and we can share it out. But it's definitely public. Uh, how does MongoDB support for embedding uh, compared with other new vector store solutions? Like, and what's the roadmap? For performance? Yeah, so um, for MongoDB, um, the approach is really about like, you know, so there are, in terms of the vector stores, there are two, two broad classes. Like, one is dedicated vector stores, and others are databases which provide you the vector management capabilities. So, MongoDB is something that's going to be in the latter. The, the differentiation uh, on the core vector embedding is like, you know, it is all on the same couple of things, HNSW as the NN store. But the differentiation really comes in from having these components of the platform, like full text search to having the embeddings management generation to having this kind of uh, scalability and multi-cloud without having any vendor lock-in. So that combined with uh, the vector database and vector store is what like, you know, differentiates MongoDB's offering, and that's the kind of roadmap. Any more questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Prakul. Thanks a lot.